Amen. Let's stand to our feet and give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Hallelujah. Come on, we can do a little better than that. We're in the presence of the Lord. He said to enter to his gates with thanksgiving, to his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. And we just come to bless the name of the Lord today. Worship the Lord. Whoa! 
if you believe that he's worthy today hallelujah could you just lift your voice and just magnify the king of kings hallelujah the lord of lords he is worthy to be praised he's worthy to be lifted up and we just magnify his name hallelujah clap your hands to the lord and give him praise
Give him some praise. Hallelujah. Come on. If he turns your mourning into dancing, your sorrow into joy. Hallelujah. I wonder if you could just lift your voice right now and begin to give him some praise. Hallelujah. Because the way that you overcome is to be able to give the praise and just to praise him and just magnify him. That's the way you're made overcomers is when you begin to lift up the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, somebody say praise the Lord. Praise Lord. Amen. God is so good. We do thank you again for being in the house of the Lord this morning. Amen. If you're visiting, we're happy to have you today. Amen. We just come to worship. We just come to praise. And we just come to give him all the glory that we can. Amen. The Bible says that he inhabits the praises of his people. And that simply means when we begin to praise him and we begin to lift him up and we begin to magnify him, his presence will settle in this place. And whatever need you may have, when you leave this place today, you don't have to leave the same way that you come in. Amen. He inhabits the praises of his people. And we've often said that there's power in praise. Amen. There's power in your praise. There's power in your praise. When you begin to praise God and when you begin to lift God up, there's a special touch that will come to you because you're praising him. Amen. And we do thank you for being here this morning. Amen. While you're standing, we want to ask our ushers to get ready to come to receive our Sunday morning tithes and offering. Amen. There's several different ways to give. You can give online. You can give through text. Amen. Or you can just give here today. And, and God will richly bless you. Amen. I learned a long time ago, as you have, I know also, that you cannot outgive God. Amen. I said, you just can't outgive God. It may not always come back in a financial, but it may come back in a healing. It may come back in a restoration. It may come back in deliverance, but it's going to come back to you in some form or fashion. You cannot outgive God. Amen. And we thank you so much. This church thanks you so much for your, your sacrifice of giving to the Lord and giving to the kingdom because it does take that. Amen. And, and that's the only way that we can move forward. Amen. Is by you giving and blessing the Lord through your giving. Amen. So we do thank you. Father, we love you. God, we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to give this morning, God. God, we thank you, Lord, for the privilege to be able to give, God, to your kingdom so that it will grow, God, and that it will move forward, God. And God, we ask you, Lord, in the name of Jesus, to bless this offering today and use it for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Go ahead, brother. Amen. And while you're standing, we want to go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Amen. We see the prayer requests this morning. You see the names up there. Amen. So many names today, and, and we know that some need healing in their body. Most of them do need healing in their body, and, and we believe that God is a healer. Amen. We believe that this morning. Brother Jason's aunt is in the hospital right now, I believe, and has a heart rate of about 35. They're getting ready to put a pacemaker. Amen. And so we want to pray for her this morning. Amen. And, and ask God to be with her this morning and let healing flow in that body this morning. Amen. If you have a need today, just let it be known by the lifting of your hands. Amen. Let's lift our hands and go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we love you. God, we thank you today, God, for your presence that we feel in this house today. And God, we thank you, Lord, for your healing, God. You said, for by your stripes we are healed. And we believe that today, God. And we believe in your promises that are yea and amen. And God, we ask it, Lord, in the name of Jesus. 
God, you see every name today, God. You see those that need healing in their body, God. And we pray, God, right now in the name of Jesus, that your healing virtue will flow from the top of their head to the sole of their feet, God. And you see every hand that's lifted today, God, representing their need today, God. God, you see Brother Jason's aunt this morning, God. We ask you, Lord, to send your angels to God right now and campeth round about her, God. And let your healing flow in that body today, God. And every hand, that God, that is lifted today, God, you know the need and you know the circumstance. And we ask it, Lord, in the name of Jesus, and we'll give you the praise and glory. And everybody say in Jesus' name, amen. Continue to worship the Lord. Like our God, there is none more. 
Hallelujah. Could we just lift our hands and just worship him for a moment? Hallelujah. Could you just lift your hands for a moment and just begin to cry out to the Lord for a moment? Hallelujah, Lord. We love you today, God. We thank you, Lord, for your mercy. God, we thank you, Lord, for your grace, God, for we know that there's no one higher than you, God. God, there's none like you today, God. You are able today, God. Hallelujah. We just give you some praise and we give you the glory today, God. Hallelujah. Just for a moment, let's just worship him for a moment. Hallelujah. We love you today, God. We worship you today, God. There is none like you today, God. There is none before you, God. And there is none after you, God. And we just give you praise and we give you glory. Hallelujah. We worship you, Lord. Amen. Put your hands together and give them a hand clap of praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. They're getting ready to sing another song. And before they do, Sister Misty has a testimony. But I will say this is a new song that we've never sung here before. So sometimes when we get sing something, people just don't want to worship. Just worship anyone. Just give God praise anyway. You don't have to know the words. You don't have to know the lyrics. He just said, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. So when they get ready to sing that in a moment, don't just stand around and think, man, I've never heard that one before. Just worship and praise God, and let's let God have his way. Sister Misty. Praise the Lord. So this song is about a covenant-keeping God, and he is a covenant-keeping God. Um, I'm thankful for his promises the bridge is this this song is um is the word we're singing the word of god and it talks about when uh, in the, the children of israel god promised them that the sun wouldn't smite them and the moon wouldn't hurt them and the wind would not sweep them the flood would not sweep them away and that is god's protection that's his promise that he gave them 
And, and sometimes they didn't live up to that. They weren't, they weren't really, uh, they didn't always live right. And, and um, sometimes we don't deserve those promises. We don't deserve that mercy. And I'm so thankful that he gives us that mercy even when we don't deserve it. He, he gives us that. And they were not always faithful. And he gives us that grace, the grace, the free life that we have, the Holy Ghost that we have to live every day. That's something that we don't deserve either. And he gives that to us every day. He gives us what we don't deserve, and he doesn't give us what we do deserve. That's what grace and mercy is all about, and that's what his promises are, and I'm so thankful for his promises.
Hallelujah. Let's put our hands together and give him some praise. Hallelujah. Come on, if you're excited about that, that he's a covenant-keeping God. Hallelujah. Let's just give him some praise and give him glory. Well, let's continue to magnify him, can we? Come on, let's glorify him. Praise God, praise God. He's worthy of all praise. Worthy is the Lord. My buckler, my shield, and my stay. My exceeding great reward. Praise God. Amen. You can put your confidence in Him. Praise the Lord. One of the qualifications for sacrifice in the Old Testament when a participant came to bring his sacrifice with a bullock, priests would uh, not do anything until the man had first brought his sacrifice, and then he had to take his hand and, the Bible said, lean upon that sacrifice had to put his weight on it and that signified that he of course was in transference of his situation on this innocent sacrifice but it signified that his confidence was in the plan of God you had to lean on it like you would lean against that wall, knowing that it would hold you up, knowing that it would be secure. And we're still leaning on the sacrifice today. Not a bullock, but the Lord Jesus Christ, who never falters nor fails, who is the Almighty. Praise the Lord. Amen. God bless you richly here today. If you'll take your Bibles with me, Turn to the book of Mark, chapter 2. Mark, chapter 2. And in the first verse of that second chapter, we'll be reading what is probably a familiar story, and no telling how many times this episode has been preached on. It's a very familiar passage of Scripture. In verse 1, and again, he that's talking about Jesus entered into Capernaum after some days. And it was noise that he was in the house. And straightway many were gathered together, insomuch that there was no room to receive them. No, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. And they come unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was. And when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. And there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, Why did this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sin but God only? course, they will regret asking that question. Turn with me to the book of John in the 8th chapter. In just verse 31. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, it's already established that they believed on him. 
And Jesus has this to say to them, starting with that stipulation word, if, if you continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Which already believed on him. But he said, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. I didn't give the scripture to people working the board here, but also I'm turning to the book of Second Kings. And uh, the 13th chapter and verse 14, Second Kings 13, verse 14. Now Elisha was fallen sick of his sickness, whereof he died. And Joash, the king of Israel, came down unto him and wept over his face and said, O oh, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And Elisha said unto him, Take bow and arrows. And he took unto him bow and arrows. And he said unto the king of Israel, Put thine hand upon the bow. And he put his hand upon it, and Elisha put his hands upon the king's hands. And he said, Open the window eastward. And he opened it. Then Elisha said, Shoot. And he shot. And he said, The arrow of the Lord's deliverance and the arrow of deliverance from Syria, for thou shalt smite the Syrians in Aphek until thou hast consumed them. And he said, Take the arrows. And he took them, and he said unto the king of Israel, Smite upon the ground. And he smote thrice and stayed. And the man of God was wrought with him. And said, Thou shouldest have smitten five or six times. Then thou hadst thou smitten Syria till thou hast consumed it, whereas now thou shalt smite Syria but thrice. Notice the sequence of events in that situation. That Joash is interested in victory. And the prophet of God tells him to shoot an arrow, and he assists him in that. And they shot the arrow through the eastward window, eastward facing window. And he said, that is the arrow of the Lord's deliverance. You will find deliverance from the Syrians. But that's not the end of the story. He said, now then take the remaining arrows that you did not have to shoot and smite them on the ground. And he smote one, two, three, and stayed. And the Bible said the prophet was wrought, mad, upset. He said, you should have smitten five or six times, you stop short. And because of that, you will only smite the Syrians three times when you could have had a complete, total victory. But you, after that era of deliverance, his expression was not all it needed to be. He didn't have a whole lot of follow-through in his situation. From these scriptures, which seem so dislocated, I'm sure, in your mind, from Mark and John and here in Second Kings, I'd like to unite them in one premise here today and talk to you about the importance of afterwards, the importance of afterwards. Let's pray and ask the Lord to help us, if you would, please.
that God would have his way in this place. In Jesus' name, we thank you, Lord, for your touch. Help us to understand the things of God as we need to, as we ought, and that you would somehow put into our hearts those things that we are in need of. And we give you the thanks and praise in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. You may be seated. You have probably also discovered that in all the events and episodes in the Bible, that there are many unfinished stories in the Bible. In other words, there's those things that happen and then they take place and then they kind of vanish from the pages of the Bible. For instance, you take the Garden of Eden. That was a real geographical place in the earth. It actually existed. The word Eden doesn't just mean paradise. It means a fenced-in or bordered place. It was the place that God had prepared to place Adam and Eve in. He said that he made and created Adam and Eve and formed them from the dust of the earth, or Adam, and then placed him in that garden. And then after man's fall, we, of course, realize that man is driven out of the Garden of Eden. And a cherubim is put at the entrance with a flaming sword that man cannot once again reestablish himself in the Eden. And that's the last you know of the geographical place of Eden, but it comes to mind, of course, whatever happened to that place. Where was it exactly? We know the Bible describes of the rivers that ran forth and the head fountain of that breaking into those various rivers, Euphrates being one of those, which is still found easily today. But to find Eden... Whatever happened to it, that special place God had made, you're left to your assumption. You're left to your uh, supposing, your imagination. Did God just remove it from the face of the earth? Did he just somehow take down the walls and it became like all the rest of the geography? It's no longer a special place. Those are just some of the assumptions you could make, but that there was a continuation. I mean, there was an after story after that Adam is driven from that. Uh, sometimes when you read of the episode of Naomi who left Jerusalem because of the famine with her husband and her sons and went into that far country, that there uh, she... Uh, has the episode of her husband dying in that land. Her sons take uh, wives in that land named Orpha and Ruth, and they also die, those two sons. And then she hears there is bread back in Jerusalem, and she returns back, and as she returns back, then these two daughter-in-laws, of course, pledged to go with her. And as she begins the trip, she begins to stop at a certain place and tell them, turn around and go back. Go back to your people and go back to your culture, your environment that you have known all your life. And they both said that they would go with Naomi. And she continued on and stopped again. And this time, when that she made the plea for them to return, it is that Ruth fell upon her shoulder and said, I will go where you go. Your God will be my God. Your people will be my people, that I will not go back. But Orpha, 
even though she wept and cried, she turned and went back to that land. There's an afterword about all that. That's the last you see of Orpha as her back is turned, going back to the land from which she originated. That's the last you see of her. But we do know that there was an afterward for her. Whatever became of Orpha, whatever happened and transpired with her, we know not. The woman that somehow was caught in the very act of adultery was brought to before Jesus, and having brought her, they were there not to somehow uh, find a, a, a just uh, a judgment about this situation. They're wanting to put Jesus into the position where they might accuse him. And they bring this woman and say, we have caught her in the very act, and the law says that she should be stoned to death. But what do you say? They're wanting to put Jesus in a predicament where that he being the compassionate uh, Christ that he was, and that somehow that if he says that she is to be stoned, then so be it. And the people will, of course, uh, not have such a favorable opinion of him and uh, if he had dismissed it altogether and said, no, don't do that, then he is a uh, rebreaker of the law. And so Jesus says nothing. He just stoops down where they're at and begins to write into the sand where they're standing. Now, again, your assumptions are, and I've heard many of those uh, through the years about what Jesus wrote. You don't know, and I don't know. As the assumptions that he began to write the Ten Commandments, that he began to uh, write all that he did, but he looked up and said unto them, You who is without sin, you cast the first stone. The accusers have to be the ones to begin this. The eyewitnesses have to be the ones that begin the stone throwing. And as he began to write in that sand, he that is without sin, let him cast the first stone. And all of a sudden, a hush fell over that little crowd. And then suddenly, they're under the predicament instead of Jesus and because they realize how sinful they are. And from the oldest to the youngest, they begin to disappear until they all had walked away. And Jesus looked at her and said, Woman, where are thine accusers? She said, there are none here. They all have left. And Jesus said, neither do I go and sin no more. That's the last you see of her. She walked away from there from a sure death now to go back to whatever it was. But there was an afterwards about this. Wherever she went and whatever she did, she was told to go and sin no more. We wonder what her life was afterwards. We wonder what... It was that transpired after she left that scene that day. And how about Lazarus? Lazarus, who was so miraculously raised from the dead, when that Jesus makes that re-entry after those days of, of waiting and coming in and met with the accusation, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And he told her, I am the resurrection and the life. Your brother shall live again. Praise the Lord. And uh, as you know the story, Lazarus was called forth from that tomb after they had rolled away the stone. He called out, Lazarus, come forth. And he which was dead came forth bound. And he said, loose him and let him go. You, you have another uh, follow-up of Lazarus at a at a dinner later on in the Bible, and the Jews came to find, uh, uh, again, accusation against Jesus and even to put Lazarus to death because he was a living, walking testimony of the power of God that Jesus had called him forth from the tomb. Amen. But after that, Lazarus disappears from the pages. But, but what about Lazarus thereafter? What about the days that followed and the years after? We know he had to have died again. 
We know that he would have again been on a deathbed and died, but we don't know all those those situations that transpire. But there was an afterward for Lazarus after that time. And one of the most remarkable events that, that easily is overlooked is on the day that Jesus resurrected from the dead. He resurrected himself, by the way. Amen. He said, this, this body I will raise again. And when that he resurrected from the dead, have you seen that part of the scripture where that certain graves of the saints were opened up? And the dead in those graves got up and went back into the cities testifying. Can you imagine that day? Can you imagine? It, I don't know how long these people had been in those graves. Amen. But all of a sudden, see your daddy coming back home. All of a sudden to see your mother, all of a sudden to see a, a brother or sister that's been in that cemetery that comes back to the house. Amen. But that's the end of the, it just makes that one little statement that the dead arose, those certain ones, out of their grave and went back into the city. Amen. After that, you don't hear anything else about it. But we know that for every one of those individuals, there was an after story. There was the events that took place in their life. What happened with them? Like Lazarus, no doubt they, of course, would die again. But we don't know the story of any of them. Those are just some of those unfinished stories that you have in the Bible. We're left to conjecture. We're left to assumption, etc., that, that we don't know. But that's not the point that I'm trying to make. The point is this. There was an afterwards in every one of those situations. Now we go back to this reading here in Mark chapter 2 where this man that is sick of palsy means that he is completely paralyzed. And he has at least four friends, thank God for that, that have heard that Jesus and the house is not named, the owner of the house is not named, but Jesus has come back from Capernaum and has went into that vicinity and goes into a house and it soon is noised abroad. By now, Jesus' fame has uh, went over the land. He's made healings of blinded folk and he has uh, done many miracles, and so now that wherever Jesus is, crowds soon collect. If they hear he's there, people with needs and situations gravitate to wherever he might be. And as he is in that house, it was noised abroad. The news soon spread throughout the community that Jesus was in this house. And when these four men heard of it, they had a friend that was uh, uh, incapacitated with this impotence of being paralyzed. And they went to him and said, there's Jesus. You know, the one that we heard that healed the opening of the blinded eyes and making the deaf to hear and raising the dead to life. We're sure he could do something for you. And we come to help you get to him. Thank God for friends. Amen. And they took him and put him on a stretcher born of four. And they begin to make their way. They're a little late getting there because now the news that has reached them and in their time is spent to uh, uh, bring this man uh, on a stretcher and the time it took them to get there. By the time they get there, the place is packed out. Not only is it full on the inside, people are standing in the windows. People are pressing at the door. The house is covered up with people. And Jesus is on the inside, not working miracles, but preaching the word unto them. Praise the Lord. And as they get there, they try to gain entry. Nobody seems to be courteous enough to let a man on a barrier through here. Nobody wants to give up their spot. They can't get through the door. Notice that the Bible makes it very clear that the door was, was completely filled with people making no entry. And so it was that they're determined to get this man to Jesus. 
we could wait until the service is over and catch him on the way out. But they knew now is the time. We got to get to him now. And so when they couldn't get in the door, they began to survey their, their uh, situations that they could somehow obtain their purpose. And they looked at the stairs going up to the house. Now, those houses were adobe type houses. Rooftops were an important part of their building. It was a place that in the evening time, many times families would go there to, to eat their meals in the cool of the day. It was, it was not a thatched roof we're talking about. We're talking about a hard adobe that will hold up people's weights. This is not just a, a thatched roof situation. And so the stairs leading up to it, they take the man up those stairs on that roof and they know Jesus is down below. And they begin to, well, I don't know if they have considered the owner or not. They got one purpose in mind, and that's to get to Jesus. And they begin to tear off, the, the Bible says, broken it up. I mean, they, and they didn't make a hole big enough just to look through. They made a hole big enough that you could take a man on a stretcher laying prone and lower him down in a prone position through that hole. That's a big hole. Amen. And can you imagine what was going on inside when this started? All of a sudden, plaster starts falling down. And people are now looking up what in the world's going on. And soon you see uh, hands coming through and the roof keep torn apart. And they keep tearing up a whole big hole. And then they see that this, they have tied ropes on the corners of this, this bear. And they have begun to lower this man into there. Can you imagine? I believe right now all attention is on the hole and what's happening with the hole. I believe Jesus is watching because he stopped and looking up, he saw their faith. And what did he see? He saw that hole. Their faith was that hole to get to Jesus. Amen. That they would make that kind of effort and determination to get him through. Now, I don't know where the owner was during all this time. But this is his house they've just ripped a big hole in the top of. Jesus doesn't condemn them. Say, hey, what, what are you guys doing? This ain't your property. Did you get permission to do that? Jesus doesn't condemn them. But looking up, he saw their faith, and the man is lowered down into the presence of Jesus. And he looks at the man and said, son, thy sins be forgiven thee. And all of a sudden, there was you could take the oxygen out of the room when he said that because those Pharisees and scribes that were sitting there, even all of a sudden, what kind of blasphemy is this? Who can forgive sins but God only? Oh, boy, they're just getting fixed up for their own. And Jesus, knowing their hearts and knowing their minds, he even said, which is easier? To tell a man that his sins are forgiven or to take up his bed and walk? Amen. Uh, only God can do either one of those. Praise the Lord. And he says to the man, rise, take up your bed and walk and get up, up and walk. He did. Amen. Showing that he was, of course, God Almighty. Amen. The one that can forgive sins. Amen. That is the greatest. That's the greatest miracle of all is the forgiveness of sins. Praise the Lord. Now, that day comes to a completion. Now, when everybody leaves the house, what about that hole? I don't know about you, but I think it got fixed. Now, you're left with several assumptions. It could be that Jesus could just speak and make it all new again. That could have happened. But you don't know that, do you? Because you don't see the afterwards. But I'll tell you what I think. I don't believe that the owner called Allstate. 
and get a person out to see about what kind of insurance we're going to get out of this. But I'll tell you what I personally think, which I believe is a better assumption, is that it got repaired by five men. Even the four that bore him and the one that was very glad to be able to patch up that hole, the one that they had brought there in the palsy state, amen, was now able to patch up a hole, amen, of where his deliverance came from. But that's just, that's just my assumption. That's just what I believe happened. Matter of fact, that you, that, but here's the point of what I'm saying is that there wasn't afterwards. There was something about that hole that we're not told about in the Bible, but you have to realize the days kept coming and the events kept transpiring and that there was an afterwards about all of that with all our consumption and all that we can somehow take about that that was something that was surely taking up in the afterwards of life. There was an afterwards Amen. That uh, afterwards it took place, whatever took place, it took place. That there was an afterwards. Y'all still staying with me here today? Amen. And so, you, you know, the, you ever been in one of those antique stores or something that says, you break it, you bought it? In other words, there will be an afterwards after you mess it up. It would be your responsibility to buy it. I used to have a, a little policy in our church in Florida. Some of the men would sometimes get excited, and, and they, for some reason, seemed to get right on that one side, and there once while somebody kicked a hole in the side of the wall. And I'd tell him, now, you may, you may have been in the spirit. Let's thank you were. Amen. But I'm telling you what, don't expect no angel to come down and fix that hole. You see this taken care of. If you kicked it in it, you fix it. Well, praise the Lord. Amen. That, that there has to be some follow-up after the episode, that there has to be some follow-through with it after that it's done. Amen. Whatever has to be done, you need to get your responsibility in your part of whatever needs to be done to do it. There's a follow-through, you hear me? Sermons don't end right here. You got to have a follow-up. You got to have a afterwards about it. You can't just leave it in this house. It ought to go out with you. Lord, let me hide thy word in my heart that I might not sin against thee. You need a follow through. You need a, an afterwards in your life in everything that concerns the things of God. Praise the Lord. Amen. What was once people's future is now our history. And what is now your future will be your kids' history. That is just the way it is. Life has its afterwards. And there is importance in afterwards. In other words, what happens next? Now what? To where now? Amen. After you have been preached to, you ought to always have something that says, now what do I do with this? We, we are so accustomed to just hearing, uh, as one uh, old custom says, in one ear and out the other ear. But like one man told his, his, his wife, said, no, it didn't even get in the first ear to start with. But, but you've got to have some follow-through. You can't just leave things where they are. In the progression of being saints of God, you've got to, like, draw in a well bucket, you know, with a rope. Amen. You can't get that well bucket to the top unless you can keep pulling the rope and holding the slack. If you don't hold the slack, it goes back to where it was. You got to draw and keep what you get. You got to have some follow through. You got to keep going on. You got to continue. If you continue, you believed. Okay, you have believed. Good. But that's not the end of the story, is it? If you continue in my words, then are you my disciples indeed. Unless you have some follow through into what I say unto you, then you are my disciples. And so you've got to have some follow through. That is exactly the story in 2 Kings. 
King Joash wanted deliverance from Assyrians. He wanted to have victory. And he goes to the man of God who is on his deathbed. And there the man's last uh, performance was to help this king in deliverance of Israel. And he says, take a bow and take an arrow. And he said, open the window eastward and shoot this arrow out the eastward window. And they shot it together. And he said, that was the arrow of the Lord's deliverance. God will deliver you from the Syrians. Oh, happy day. Amen. I mean, that the story could have ended right there. That God is going to give you the victory. But Elisha said, now there's got to be a little follow-up in this. Now take the other arrows and smite them on the ground. Amen. And the king have hardly. You can see his, he's already been promised deliverance. But he doesn't have the enthusiasm in the afterwards that he ought to have. He goes once, twice, three times and stays. And the prophet was upset. And he said, what's the matter with you? You just got a promise of God's deliverance. And that's all that you're going to do. You should have smitten five or six times uh, with enthusiasm. But because you didn't have the right follow-up, you're not going to have the right afterwards. I see people come to an altar and they pray for help and then they get up and think it ends right there. It doesn't end there. It just started there. Now you've got to have some follow through. I've seen, actually seen people come and get the Holy Ghost and you never see them again. You ever see that? Sad, right? And invariably, somebody says, well, they didn't get all they needed. I beg your pardon. If they got the Holy Ghost, they got every bit of what they needed. That's not the problem in the sufficiency of God. The problem was they didn't do anything with what they got. They didn't have any follow-through with it. Uh, that you can get the Holy Ghost and walk out and never come back. But the reason you're still in that pew is you kept on coming back. Uh, you begin to have an afterwards from that altar and your experience of a new birth that it doesn't end there. It just started there. Now you got to have the afterwards. And to continue in those things, as he says, amen. But he said, you just didn't have enough follow through. You didn't. Matter of fact, they teach you in baseball, I think, and maybe even golf. Probably other things, too. But when you're swinging at a ball, you don't swing just to hit it. You swing to hit it, but you swing with a commitment to follow on through after you hit it. Amen. You don't just walk in there and hit it. That's called a bunt. But with a full swing... The same thing with the swing of a golf club. You don't stop when you hit the ball. You follow through. Amen. And then when did you follow through? It's part of the whole in, uh, concise business of hitting the ball. And the same thing's true in living for God. You can't just stop in one place. You got to keep on keeping on. You got to continue in His Word. Jesus said you... It started out well running this race, but you stopped somewhere in the course. You did run well. You did so good at the start. When the shot of the gun went off, man, you got with it. Somewhere, you stopped. He said, most people quote this wrong. I hear them quote it all the time. What did hinder? No, it doesn't say what did hinder. It said who did hinder. It's usually a who rather than a what that messes up the race. Amen. When you start the race, you got to finish the race. 
Amen. All the who's and whatever situations you got to pass by, you got to keep running the race. You got to keep putting one foot ahead of the other one. You got to have an afterwards. Uh, amen. The, 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 the takeoff is not the end of this. You got to hear, Well done, my good and faithful servant. He that endureth to the end, the same shall be saved. Amen. You got to have enough in you to get your second wind and keep on going and keep on trucking. You can't stop regardless what kind of fallacies you run into and obstacles. Sometimes the who is you and me. For it's who did hinder. Amen. This preaching, like I said, that we're living in a generation that has made preaching almost a uh, uh, an enjoyment rather than something that leads to life everlasting. They, they want to, they're interested in listening to somebody as long as they'll tell them jokes. As long as they'll be without any guilt throwing on anybody. As long as it's all nice and sickly uh, pablum and palaver that doesn't do anything for anybody but preaching that will somehow challenge your life and make you look at your life is the kind of preaching that is valuable to you. But you got to have an afterwards after that. you got to have a follow-through in that. You can't leave it here. Same thing's true about revival. Revival is something that doesn't just all of a sudden explode in a church and you have revival. Revival is something that is initiated worked on, progressed on, and keeping at it when it looks like sometimes things are not going like they ought to go. That's when, the, like the old saying goes, when the tough gets going, or the going gets tough, the tough get going. Praise the Lord. That you got to have some follow through. you got to have some stick to it. On a reason, it stands worth whatever it's worth now. Can't keep up with it. The only reason it's worth whatever it is is because it stays stuck, brother. If it doesn't stay stuck, it ain't worth anything. It's got to stay stuck to the envelope before it has any value for it to do what it's supposed to do. Amen. And the same thing's true about I've seen folks with hit and miss. They can come to church or not come to church. Amen. They can miss it, and it's no big deal. Amen. I, I'm a part of church and, and so forth. So, But I'm telling you, that my Bible said, forsake not the assembly of yourselves together after the manner of some. You don't want to be in the manner of some. You want to be part of the part that when the church doors are open, you ought to be here. You ought to be coming in, entering his gates with thanksgiving, his courts with praise, and bless the Lord, O oh, my soul, and all that's in me. Bless his holy name. You got to have some follow through, brother. You got to keep on keeping on. Because when it gets where you run into opposition and problems and troubles, that's where that makes the difference whether you're a saint or you're an ain't. Is that you can keep on pressing your way into the kingdom of heaven. Let's stand, would you please? Jesus made it very clear. He said, to those that believe on him, You think that's all it takes? He just believed on him? But he said, if to those that believe, this is not talking to rank sinners. This isn't talking to folks that are doing anything and everything they want. This is folks that believed on him. He said, if, that's a stipulation, if you continue, if you keep on keeping on, then, in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. Follow through. Keep on, keep it on, day in, day out. The only way we're going to hear well done is to do well. And the only way you can do well is keep on continuing in the things of God. Anybody can wave the white flag at any place in life and feel justified in doing so, but there are no excuses that are good enough to say why you can't live for God. There are none. That's why every man will stand speechless before the judgment day of Christ because you won't have any excuse because there are none that are legitimate if you continue.
if you continue, if you keep praying, if you keep worshiping, if you keep doing what you need to do, if you keep working on yourself, if you keep worshiping and, and coming to the house of God, if you continue in my word, in those things his word about church, about praying, about worship, about faithfulness, about giving, all those things are part of his word. And if you continue in them, then are you my disciples indeed. You're truly a disciple if you got it, follow through. You got an afterwards from here to today. Yes, you do. I, I, I don't want to leave it to assumption that somehow, like Orpha, you just disappeared. I want to be like Demas, having loved this present world. See, that's another unfinished story. Whatever happened to Demas? Having loved this present world, turned and walked away. But he had an afterwards. God forbid that your afterwards should be a place in hell. But you're going to have an afterwards. Either one or two things in your afterwards. Either you're going to live for God or you're going to be lost. There are no other afterwards for eternity. There are no others. I don't know about you, but I want to be like the man that said, as far as me and my house, we will serve. And the word serve there is a continual progressive word. We will continue to serve the Lord. Choose you this day whom you will serve. You believe on me, that's wonderful, that's good. You're believing right now. And I've seen, like I said, folks that would they'd run the aisles and and in, in a, less than a month's time, God only knows what they're doing and what they're into. Folks that come to church that never change. There's something wrong with that. There's something bad wrong with this ought to be something that we're continually changing into that self-same image day after day, week after week. We ought to be getting more like Jesus. But there's some that come and hear the Word and they keep on living just like they always live. They go back out and go back the same way. They come to an altar and and cry and boo-hoo and wipe tears and then get up and walk right out of here and go back to their own sinful way. That's not repentance. Repentance is turn around. Die out too. Forsake. And turn your heart toward God fully. That's repentance. But all of us are going to have an afterwards All of us can look around and see the history of maybe some of these seats that are empty of people that one time sit here, but they're afterwards just not a good story. Please don't let that be your afterwards. There's an importance as to what your follow-through is all about. Seeking Him as we lift our hands here today. Maybe some of you would like to gather around the front here and just say, God, I want to rededicate because I know tomorrow what may come and what may go I want to be found living for you I want to be found clutched tightly holding to the hem of your garment I want to live for you regardless of what I must go through what must come my way Jesus in your name as they play and sing here just a moment